Hello, fifth graders, and welcome to your language arts lesson for today. For today, you will need your copy of Little Women. And then again, if you've been writing down answers as you go or keeping notes or jotting down thoughts to help you with your homework, you'll want that paper and pencil. So go ahead and get those things and then come on back and join me. So as a reminder, make sure you're checking those comments that I left for your assignment on Friday, making sure that if you've been asked for corrections, you're making those corrections. And always, as always, if you're having questions, things you want to talk through with me, then make sure you see me at office hours or set up another time to chat with me as well. For today, our main objective is going to be identifying theme evidence. We will also keep working on that skill of selecting quotes to support our answers. As a reminder, as we're getting into today's work, these are the three themes we've been discussing as we've read Little Women. One, those societal expectations of women at the time. Two, the importance of living a virtuous life. And three, the relationship between money and happiness. And again, this is really a question, right? That Louisa May Alcott is posing this as a question. Is there a relationship? Does money lead to happiness or not? And we're, you know, we've talked a lot about um, some characters believe so, others very firmly do not believe so. Um, so when we're answering questions about themes, you want to be making sure you're picking one of those three themes. So I'm going to flip you around. We're going to take a quick look at our homework questions together, and then we'll get into the lesson for today. <clears throat> So number one asks, how does Aunt March feel about Amy? Two asks, what did Esther help Amy arrange? And this also indicates to us that we're going to meet a new character today named Esther. Three, what was Amy doing when Lori came to visit her? Four, what did Amy write? Five, why was Amy crying at the end of the chapter? Short answers, we wanna make sure you're setting it up using as many words as possible. So Amy was crying at the end of the chapter because. Six, to which theme does this relate? So this relates to the theme. Seven, what is one quote that shows that Amy is trying to be less conceited? So two things here, well, a few things I guess you'd say. Remember that conceited, this is the word that we talked about earlier. It's what Mrs. March has told Amy she needs to work on correcting. So to be conceited is to think too highly of yourself, excessively highly of yourself, okay? So we wanna make sure you're picking a quote that shows that. We need to make sure that the quote would be the author's exact words straight from the text. And even though I'm asking you for a quote, you still need to set up this answer. So. One quote that shows that Amy is trying to be less conceited is, and then you can say your quote. And then finally, this vocabulary word, exile. Okay, so you're going to uh, pick which of the following correctly uses this word exile. And remember, I have that whole list of vocabulary words for you with the instructions. So with that in mind, fifth graders, we're going to get right into, ooh, sorry, shaky, shaky. Today's lesson, we're reading chapter 19. So you want to turn to page 188 and follow along as we get into today's reading. Oh, a couple of things that I want to do, add to set up the stage here, to set the stage. Um, will, we're going to talk about a will. And so um, perhaps you've heard of a will before. This is where somebody writes down what they want to happen with their possessions, with their land, with their money, with any valuables that they have. Um, after they pass. So they often will say, okay, when I die, I want my jewelry to go to this person. I want my home to go to this person and so on and so forth. So they write what's called the last will and testament. Okay. In addition, a reminder, we've seen hints of this throughout the text that the marches are Christian. Um, and so Amy is going to interact with a woman named Esther, who is Catholic, which is a type of Christianity, and they're going to talk a little bit about this. So this will show up a little bit in there. And um, we'll hear about a chapel, which is a place where you could, where Christians might go to pray. Okay. So some, just some background information that'll be helpful for understanding today's chapter. Okay. Um, also, as a reminder, there's a lot of details I'm forgetting to add, but remember that Amy was sent away um, because Beth had scarlet fever and they didn't want Amy to get scarlet fever. And so we, the readers, have learned at the end of this most recent chapter that Beth has improved. She's doing better. Okay. However, 
the chapter now where we're at is like back in time. So even though we've sort of seen Beth go through these dark days and then come back out, we're going to be sort of rewinding back in time. So Amy's going to be referring to Beth's health as being not great. And so we have to assume that, you know, that hasn't happened yet or that Amy doesn't know the details of this yet. Okay. Okay. Now we can get into the reading. While these things were happening at home, Amy was having hard times at Aunt March's. She felt her exile deeply and for the first time in her life realized how much she was beloved and petted at home. So Amy's kind of realizing how much everybody looks out for her and takes care of her and does what she wants at home and that she's struggling now that she's with Aunt March who's doing like none of those things for her. Aunt March never petted anyone. She did not approve of it. But she meant to be kind, for the well-behaved little girl pleased her very much, and Aunt March had a soft place in her old heart for her nephew's children, though she didn't think proper to confess it. She really did her best to make Amy happy, but dear me, what mistakes she made. Some old people keep young at heart in spite of wrinkles and gray hairs, can sympathize with children's little cares and joys, make them feel at home, and can hide wise lessons under pleasant plays, giving and receiving friendship in the sweetest way. But Aunt March had not this gift, and she worried Amy very much with her rules and orders, her prim ways and long, prosy talks. Finding the child more docile and amiable than her sister, the old lady felt it her duty to try and counteract as far as possible the bad effects of home freedom and indulgence. So she took Amy in hand and taught her as she herself had been taught 60 years ago, a process which carried dismay to Amy's soul and made her feel like a fly in the web of a very strict spider. So Aunt March believes that Marmee and Mr. March are too indulgent, too kind, too generous with their children. She believes that there should be more strictness and more rules and more order. However, she does like Amy better than Joe because Joe, obviously, we know is kind of rambunctious and rebellious and difficult. And so she looks at Amy and thinks, well, she's sweet. And she so she kind of wants to take this sweet Amy and, and help her to become um, improved as far as Aunt March is concerned by strictness. She, Amy, had to wash cups, the cups every morning and polish up the old-fashioned spoons, the fat silver teapot, and the glasses till they shone. Then she must dust the room, and what a trying job that was. Not a speck escaped Aunt March's eye, and all the furniture had claw legs and much carving, which was never dusted to suit. Then Polly must be fed, the lapdog combed, and a dozen trips upstairs and down to get things or deliver orders, for the old lady was very lame and seldom left her big chair. After these tiresome labors, she must do her lessons, which was a daily trial of every virtue she possessed. Then she was allowed one hour for exercise and play, and <laughs> didn't she enjoy it? Laurie came every day and wheedled Aunt March till Amy was allowed to go out with him when they walked and rode and had capital times. After dinner, she had to read aloud and sit still while the old lady slept, which she usually did for an hour as she dropped off over the first page. Then patchwork or towels appeared, and Amy sewed with the outward meekness and inward rebellion till dusk, when she was allowed to amuse herself as she liked till tea time. The evenings were the worst of all, for Aunt Mar March fell to telling long stories about her youth, which were so unutterably dull that Amy was always ready to go to bed, intending to cry over her hard fate, but usually going to sleep before she had squeezed out more than a tear or two. If it had not been for Lori and old Esther, the maid, she felt that she never could have got through that dreadful time. The parrot alone was enough to drive her distracted, for he soon felt that she did not admire him and revenged himself by being as mischievous as possible. He pulled her hair whenever she came near him, upset his bread and milk to plague her when she had newly cleaned his cage, made Mop bark, so we can infer that Mop is probably the dog's name, by pecking at him while Madame dozed, called her names before company, and behaved in all respects like a reprehensible old bird. Then she could not endure the dog, a fat cross beast who snarled and yelped at her when she made his toilet who lay on his back with all his legs in the air and a most idiotic expression of countenance when he wanted something to eat, which was about a dozen times a day. The cook was bad-tempered, the old coachman deaf, and Esther the only one who ever took any notice of the young lady. 
So we're going to learn a little bit more about Esther now. Um, but she's the maid. She's Aunt Marta's maid. So she does the housework there. Okay. We also have an answer to number one at this point about how Aunt March generally feels about Amy. So if you're feeling stuck, you can, I would go back and really look at the first paragraph of the chapter. Esther was a French woman who had lived with Madame, as she called her mistress, for many years, and who rather tyrannized over the old lady, who could not get along without her. Her real name was Estelle, but Aunt March ordered her to change it, and she obeyed on condition that she was never asked to change her religion. I find this typically Aunt March, right? Her name is Estelle, but Aunt March doesn't want to call her that. So she says, no, you're Esther now. She took a fancy to Mademoiselle. That's in reference to Amy. Amy is Mademoiselle. And amused her very much with odd stories of her life in France. When Amy sat with her while she got up Madame's laces, she also allowed her to roam about the great house and examine the curious and pretty things stored away in the big wardrobes and the ancient chests. For Aunt March hoarded like a magpie. Amy's chief delight was an Indian cabinet full of queer drawers, little pigeonholes, and secret places in which were kept all sorts of ornaments, some precious, some merely curious, all more or less antique. To examine and arrange these things gave Amy great satisfaction, especially the jewel cases, in which on velvet cushions reposed the ornaments which had adorned a bell 40 years ago. So we're seeing all the jewelry that Aunt March would have worn when she was young and courting and trying to find a husband, and but she doesn't wear it anymore. There was the garnet set which Aunt March wore when she came out. The pearls her father gave her on her wedding day, her lover's diamonds, the jet mourning rings and pins, the queer lockets with portraits of dead friends and weeping willows made of hair inside, the baby bracelets her one little daughter had worn. Uncle March's big watch with the red seal so many childish hands had played with, and in a box all by itself lay Aunt March's wedding ring, too small now for her fat finger, but put carefully away like the most precious jewel of them all. Which would Mademoiselle choose if she had her will, asked Esther, who always sat near to watch over and look up the valuables. Um, in this case, will means if she had her way, if she could have her choice. I like the diamonds best, but there is no necklace among them, and I'm fond of necklaces. They are so becoming. I should choose this, if I might, replied Amy, looking with great admiration at a string of gold and ebony beads from which hung a heavy cross of the same. I, too, covet that, but not as a necklace. Ah, no, to me it is a rosary, and as such I should use it like a good Catholic, said Esther, eyeing the handsome thing wistfully. So Amy's seeing the string of beads with a cross on it, which she's thinking is a necklace that she really likes. And so Esther is explaining that it's what's called a rosary, which would be like prayer beads, a type of prayer beads that you can use. So she's saying, oh, you wouldn't wear it, you use it to pray. Is it meant to use as you use the string of good-smelling wooden beads hanging over your glass, asked Amy. Truly, yes, to pray with. It would be pleasing to the saints if one used so fine a rosary as this, instead of wearing it as a vain bijou. You seem to take a great deal of comfort in your prayers, Esther, and always come down looking quiet and satisfied. I wish I could. If Mademoiselle was a Catholic, she would find true comfort. But as that is not to be, it would be well if you went to part each day to meditate and pray, as did the good mistress whom I served before, madame. She had a little chapel, and in it found solacement for much trouble. And so Esther's talking about using a chapel, like a prayer room, for going to pray a little bit every day. Would it be right for me to do so, asked Amy, who in her loneliness felt the need of help of some sort, and found that she was apt to forget her little book, now that Beth was not there to remind her of it. And the little book is a reference to the Bible, which would be the Christian religious text. It would be excellent and charming, and I shall gladly arrange the little dressing room for you if you like it. Say nothing to Madame, but when she sleeps, go you and sit alone a while to think good thoughts and pray the dear God to preserve your sister. Esther was truly pious and quite sincere in her advice, for she had an affectionate heart and felt much for the sisters in their anxiety. Amy liked the idea and gave her leave to arrange the light closet next to her room, hoping it would do her good. So we have an answer to number two about what Esther is going to help um, Amy arrange. I wish I knew where all these pretty things would go when Aunt March dies, she said, as she slowly replaced the shining rosary and shut the jewel cases one by one. To you and your sisters, I know it. 
Madame confides in me. I witnessed her will, and it is to be so, whispered Esther, smiling. So this will is like the, the thing that I was telling you at the beginning of the lesson, like a will and testament. How nice, but I wish you'd let us have them now. Procrastination is not agreeable, observed Amy, taking a last look at the diamonds. It is too soon yet for the young ladies to wear these things. The first one who is affianced will have the pearls. Madame has said it. Affianced. You maybe are hearing this word fiancé in there. And so we would say engaged. If someone is affianced, it means they're engaged. So the first March girl who's gonna, who gets engaged will have these pearls. And I have a fancy that the little turquoise ring will be given to you when you go. For Madame approves your good behavior and charming manners. Do you think so? Oh, I'll be a lamb if I can only have that lovely ring. It's ever so much prettier than Kitty Bryant's. I do like Aunt Marge after all. And Amy tried on the blue ring with a delighted face and a firm resolve to earn it. So this is also sort of a humorous Amy moment, right? Esther says, mm, Aunt Marge is considering giving you this ring based on good behavior, you know, if you leave. And so Amy thinks, oh, I'll be so good. But then she also had this moment of like, I want it because it's better than Kitty Bryant's ring. And then also kind of says, well, I guess I like Aunt March after all, just because Aunt March is giving her things. So it's sort of an Amy moment. From that day, she was a model of obedience and the old lady complacently admired the success of her training. So we should also be giggling at this reader that Amy is we know Amy's trying to be good because she just wants the ring. But Aunt March is thinking, oh, all of my strictness and my rules is making her so much better. So there's kind of, we see the two sides of it and should find some entertainment in it. Esther fitted up the closet with a little table, placed a footstool before it, and over it a picture taken from one of the shut up rooms. She thought it was of no great value, but being appropriate, she borrowed it, well knowing that Madame would never know it, nor care if she did. It was, however, a very valuable copy of one of the famous pictures of the world, and Amy's beauty-loving eyes were never tired of looking up at the sweet face of the Divine Mother, while tender thoughts of her own were busy at her heart. On the table, she laid her little testament and hymn, hymn book, kept a vase always full of the best flowers Lori brought her, and came every day to sit alone thinking good thoughts and praying the dear God to preserve her sister. Esther had given her a rosary of black beads with a silver cross, but Amy hung it up and did not use it, feeling doubtful as to its fitness for Protestant prayers. The little girl was very sincere in all this, for being left alone outside the safe home nest, she felt the need of some kind hand to hold by so sorely that she instinctively turned to the strong and tender friend whose fatherly love most closely surrounds his little children. She missed her mother's help to understand and rule herself, but having been taught where to look, she did her best to find the way and walk in it confidingly. But Amy was a young pilgrim, and just now her burdens seemed very heavy. She tried to forget herself, to keep cheerful and be satisfied with doing right, though no one saw or praised her for it. In her first effort at being very, very good, she decided to make her will, as Aunt March had done, so that if she did fall ill and die, her possessions might be justly and generously divided. It cost her a pang even to think of giving up the little treasures, which in her eyes were as precious as the old lady's jewels. During one of her play hours, she wrote out the important document as well as she could, with some help from Esther as to certain legal terms. And when the good-natured Frenchwoman had signed her name, Amy felt relieved and laid it by to show Lori, whom she wanted as a second witness. As it was a rainy day, she went upstairs to amuse herself in one of the large chambers, and took Polly with her for company. In this room, there was a wardrobe full of old-fashioned costumes with which Esther was, had allowed her to play, and it was her favorite amusement to array herself in the faded brocades and parade up and down before a long mirror, making stately curtsies and sweeping her train about with a rustle which delighted her ears. So Amy's basically playing dress-up and kind of promenading around and pretending to be a fine lady. So busy was she on this day that she did not hear Lori's ring, nor see his face peeping in at her as she gravely promenaded to and fro, flirting her fan and tossing her head, on which she wore a great pink turban, 
contrasting oddly with her blue brocade dress and yellow quilted petticoat. She was obliged to walk carefully, for she had on high-heeled shoes, and as Lori told Joe afterward, it was as a comical sight to see her mince along in her day suit, with Polly sidling and bridling just behind her, imitating her as well as he could, and occasionally stopping to laugh or exclaim, Ain't we fine? Get along, you fright! Hold your tongue! Kiss me, dear! Ha ha! So as Amy's walking up and down, the bird is following her and kind of mimicking her. Having with difficulty restrained an explosion of merriment, lest it should offend Her Majesty, Lori tapped and was graciously received. Uh, so fifth graders, we have actually seen the answers to three and four as well. So making sure you're looking for those as we go. Sit down and rest while I put these things away. Then I want to consult you about a very serious manner, said Amy, when she had shown her splendor and driven Polly into a corner. That bird is the trial of my life, she continued, removing the pink mountain from her head while Lori seated himself astride of a chair. Yesterday, when Aunt was asleep and I was trying to be as still as a mouse, Polly began to squall and flap about in his cage. So I went to let him out and found a big spider there. I poked it out and it ran under the bookcase. Polly marched straight after it, stooped down and peeped under the bookcase, saying in his funny way, with a cock of his eye, Come out and take a walk, my dear. I couldn't help laughing, which made Paul swear, and Aunt woke up and scolded us both. Did the spider accept the old fellow's invitation? asked Lori, yawning. Yes, out it came, and away ran Polly, frightened to death, and scrambled up on Aunt's chair, calling out, Catcher, 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 as I chased the spider. That's a lie. Oh, Lor, cried the parrot, pecking at Lori's toes. I'd wring your neck if you were mine, you old torment, cried Lori, shaking his fist at the bird, who put his head on one side and gravely croaked, Alleluia, bless your buttons, dear. Now I'm ready, said Amy, shutting the wardrobe and taking a paper out of her pocket. I want you to read that, please, and tell me if it is legal and right. I feel that I ought to do it, for life is uncertain, and I don't want any ill feeling over my tomb. Lori bit his lips and, turning a little from the pensive speaker, read the following document with praiseworthy gravity, considering the spelling. So we see that Lori's trying to take Amy very seriously in this moment because she's trying to be serious, but that he's kind of holding back some laughter. My last will and testament. I, Amy Curtis March, being in my same mind, do give and bequeath all my earthly property, to wit, namely, to my father, my best pictures sketches, maps, and works of art, including frames. Also my $100 to do what he likes with. To my mother, all my clothes, except the blue apron with pockets. Also my likeness and my medal, with much love. To my dear sister Margaret, I give my turquoise ring, if I get it. Also my green box with the doves on it. Also my piece of real lace for her neck, and my sketch of her as a memorial of her little girl. To Joe, I leave my breastpin, the one mended with sealing wax, also my bronze inkstand. She lost the cover, and my most precious plaster rabbit, because I am sorry I burned up her story. To Beth, if she lives after me, I give my dolls and the little bureau, my fan, my linen collars, and my new slippers, if she can wear them, being thin when she gets well. And I herewith also leave her my regret that I ever made fun of old Joanna. To my friend and neighbor, Theodore Lawrence, I bequeath my paper mache portfolio, my clay model of a horse, though he did say it hadn't any neck. Also in return for his great kindness, in the hour of affliction, any one of my artistic works he likes, Notre Dame is the best. To our venerable benefactor, Mr. Lawrence, I leave my purple box with a looking glass in the cover, which will be nice for his pens and remind him of the departed girl who thanks him for his favors to her family, especially Beth. I wish my favorite playmate, Kitty Bryant, to have the blue silk apron and my gold bead ring with a kiss. To Hannah, I give the bandbox she wanted and all the patchwork I leave, hoping she will remember me when it you see. And now, having disposed of my most valuable property, I hope all will be satisfied and not blame the dead. I forgive everyone and trust we may all meet when the trump shall sound. Amen. To this will and testament, I set my hand and seal on this 20th day of November, Ani Domino, 1861. Amy Curtis March with two witnesses, Estelle Valner and Theodore Lawrence. So there's a lot of sort of humorous things happening in this will. First of all, again, like I said, you're often supposed to be leaving valuable things. 
and Amy is leaving things that are valuable to her, right? The artwork that she's created, a fan, um, a ring that she doesn't even own. So that's sort of funny. She's giving away the ring, but she hasn't even received it yet. Um, she kind of makes a jab at Joe, right? She can have my ink stand. She lost the cover, right? So it's, it's sort of humorous. And even at the end, this Ani Domino, the phrase is Ano Domini, right? So she's, again, there's these mistakes. There's spelling arrows all throughout. So we see Amy in this will. And she means well, but there is some humor in it. Um, the last name was written in pencil, and Amy explained that he was to rewrite it in ink and seal it up for her properly. What put it into your head? Did anyone tell you about Beth's giving away her things? Asked Lori soberly, as Amy laid a bit of red tape with sealing wax, a taper, and a standish before him. She explained and then asked anxiously, What about Beth? I'm sorry I spoke, but as I did, I'll tell you. She felt so ill one day that she told Joe she wanted to give her piano to Meg, her cats to you, and the poor old doll to Joe, who would love it for her sake. She was sorry she had so little to give and left locks of hair to the rest of us and her best love to Grandpa. She never thought of a will. Lori was signing and sealing as he spoke and did not look up till a great tear dropped on the paper. Amy's face was full of trouble, but she only said, don't people put sort of postscripts to their wills sometimes? Yes, codicils, they call them. Put one in mind then, that I wish all my curls cut off and given round to my friends. I forgot it, but I want it done, though it will spoil my looks. Lori added it, smiling at Amy's last and greatest sacrifice. Then he amused her for an hour and was much interested in all her trials. But when he came to go, Amy held him back to whisper with trembling lips, is there really any danger about Beth? I'm afraid there is, but we must hope for the best, so don't cry, dear. And Laurie put his arms about her with a brotherly gesture, which was very comforting. When he had gone, she went to her little chapel and sitting in the twilight, prayed for breath, Beth with streaming tears and an aching heart, feeling that a million turquoise rings would not console her for the loss of her gentle little sister. Okay, so we see... Amy's crying at the end of the chapter, and this last paragraph really gets at that. Why is she crying? That's our answer to number five. So what is she thinking in her tears? And then which theme would this relate to? Throughout this chapter for number seven, there's lots of quotes that would show that Amy's trying to be less conceited. So just pick one of them. So for five, six, and seven, make sure you're restating the question in your answer. Okay. And then we have our vocabulary sentence. So fifth graders, make sure if you have questions, let me know. Um, I guess I'll refresh your memory as we're wrapping up too about our three themes. So you can pause and take a look if you are needing to. Um, and let me know if you have any questions or need anything.